Hi, everyone. This is Charles Hoskinson broadcasting pre-recorded from warm, sunny Colorado. Always warm, always sunny, sometimes Colorado. Today's video is a video about global events. And the global event that we are all living through is coronavirus. And I imagine if you are like me or most people floating around, uh, you have Corona fatigue. You know, we're just tired of it. We're done with it. We've been living with this for over a year. Uh, imagine how the world felt with World War II. Uh, that lasted six years from 1939 to 1945. And sometimes you have events that last decades or even centuries. Uh, there's been more than one plague that lasted decades. For example, there was a smallpox epidemic during the time of Marcus Aurelius that fundamentally transformed the Roman Empire, and many historians believe was a contributing cause to the decline of the Roman Empire's supremacy. Uh, there have been uh, regime changes or dictatorships or other things in areas like China throughout its multi-thousand year history that have lasted a long period of time, like uh, the Warring States period, where China was fractured into many small states. Uh, but global events are very rare, and they tend to be measured on the century-by-century -century basis. And this is the first global event of the information age. The breakup of the Soviet Union happened right at the beginning of the modern commercial internet, and we weren't quite there yet. Had that happened during the information age, we would have seen a very different outcome and it would have probably been a little bit more fracturous. But because it occurred right at the end of the old age, the age of curated and controlled media, curated and controlled flow of information, uh, it didn't quite have that same impact that coronavirus is having today. So coronavirus touches every aspect of human society. It's not a medical issue. In fact, most people uh, who are treating it that way are, are like looking through a keyhole into a very elaborate room and then perhaps they can only see the sofa or the desk and they say, well, that's what it is, ignoring the fact that this room is huge and there's lots of stuff in it. In fact, there's a great video from Lex Friedman that I really, really enjoyed and it's the seven levels of the coronavirus attack. And Lex actually goes through the biological, psychological, social, economic, political, existential, and philosophical levels of uh, what coronavirus is doing. And this is actually a slightly older video. It came out in March of last year. Uh, so uh, if he got a do-over, there'd be a lot more to say. And there's a really cool book, actually, from Nicholas uh, Christakis. And he's a brilliant author and a very brilliant man. He has an MD, PhD, and a master's of public health, eminently qualified to look at things from a business perspective, an economic perspective, but then also a health perspective. And it's called Apollo's Arrow. And he actually wrote it during the pandemic to discuss what it's doing to society as a whole. So anyway, uh, this is a global event of the information age. And the first challenge that we're facing is how to get good information. The problem is that all of our mass media is controlled and curated, and they love pushing 24-7 fear porn. Everything's a scandal. Everything has to have villains and heroes. Uh, everything has a political ideology behind it, whether it be conservative or liberal. And as a consequence, this has created an enormous amount of distrust. And it's created a bit of skepticism as well. And that's okay. It's okay to be distrustful and skeptical of information as you receive it. If you have the time to perform a proper analysis, you can figure out fact from fiction. But the problem with the information age is that it doesn't just improve access to information, it improves the quantity of information. And when your quantity goes up, let's use a different marker. When your quantity of information goes up and your level of access for information goes up, 
then you have a situation where the tools for analysis simply don't work. For example, this happens even in the academic world. The coronavirus crisis being a global crisis has gotten more scientists to think and work on it than probably anything else in recent memory. So most of them are publishing on preprints because it's important to get information out. The entire academic medical peer review infrastructure is DDoSed at the moment. There's just simply too much scientific literature being produced and it's becoming exceedingly difficult to actually rigorously read it and analyze it. So this is a curated controlled system. It still kind of lives as if the internet didn't exist. And there's a collection of regular known access points and distribution points and uh, curators. And those curators, the tools that they use to analyze what's real and what's not real, uh, what's good and what's not good are overwhelmed because so many people are focusing on this particular topic. Now, each and every one of us gets incredibly overwhelmed. And the problem is that the normal curation mechanisms, mass media, they have become biased, if they've probably always been biased, but exceedingly so, and compromised by a desire to maximize fear. So everything that occurs has an ideology behind it. And that ideology uh, if you disagree with it, you're an evil, horrible person. And also, uh, they will ignore things that are inconvenient to that ideology and overemphasize things that are convenient to it. So political opponents are always incompetent. Everything is bad. A great example would be in the United States, uh, Biden, our new president, has this goal of a million vaccines, uh, 100 million vaccinations in 100 days. Okay. 100 million and 100 days. Okay, so the narrative that's now being pushed by mass media is that there was no plan when Biden took office. Uh, and Biden uh, basically has to rebuild from scratch. That's being pushed by CNN, it's being pushed by the New York Times and so forth. The day that Biden took office, the average vaccination rate was approximately 1 million people per day. Okay. So before he did anything, before he instituted anything, the pre-existing regime, the existing uh, method of distribution was getting about a million people per day. And that's off of two vaccine platforms. In February, we're going to have likely four vaccine platforms. So how can we rely on media, mass media, when basic facts and reality are distorted? And so what does that do? It creates distrust and skepticism. I don't believe anything that's reported by CNN or the New York Times or any of these other outlets until I get a second source or a third source. And then what I have to do is piece together information. And it takes quite a bit of time because unfortunately the tools for analysis aren't so good. And in many cases, that information is still siloed. It's not quite liquid. Uh, another example would be the difference between the reporting of the uh, Trump rallies and the BLM protests. Okay. So in the case of the Trump rallies, these were labeled super spreader events and a contributing cause to the spread of Corona and absolutely unnecessary. The BLM protests, over 1000 epidemiologists, doctors, and other people signed an open letter saying we should allow them to happen to combat systemic racism. Both of these are examples of events for political speech, one for a particular movement, the other for a particular candidate, but they're both political speech. And what we're basically told is that virus, not an issue here. So apparently it's a woke virus here, virus, horrible. It's going to kill all of us. And a lot of people say, well, systemic racism is a huge problem in society. Okay. Well, the people who live in the Trump side of the spectrum think endemic socialism and the woke cult is a huge problem for society and will result in depression and chaos and war and problems. 
both sides have strong beliefs and about half of America sits on one or the other. So they're both political speech at the end of the day about what we should do for future society, not today, and how we're going to resolve those things. There's no urgency behind either of them in that you actually have to aggregate a large crowd to solve that problem that day. No legislation was passed in either case. It's political speech. And our mass media told us that that political speech in one is going to result in an outcome that the virus is going to massively spread, but then in the other, it will not, which is just a bizarre statement. There were literally tens of millions of people across the United States who went to multi-day rallies, densely packed, and you could follow the data, and I actually did, and you could see that there were spikes from both events. In fact, a very famous American politician, Herman Cain, died as a result of a Trump rally. And there were big spikes of coronavirus that were directly correlated with BLM protests, apparently ignored in one case, the other case not. So mass media is not a good tool for curation. And this is a global event. And what we need is better tools for analysis and curation because the access to the information through social media is extraordinary. And the quantity that's being produced every day is too much for a human to curate. So for coronavirus in particular, what I've done is I've put together a list of sources. People often ask me, how do I determine fact from fiction? First, for anything that happens, you need to understand and get a basic set of facts. You need to understand it. And you need to understand it in a rigorous way because it does impact your life, your livelihood. For example, asking questions, will the vaccines be effective or not? How much longer is this going to last? At what point do we hit an inflection point where we accept that people are going to die, but we let life go back to normal? Because, for example, with influenza, we do that despite the fact that people die without these special measures. Okay. So to understand it, turns out that MIT has done something really, really, really cool. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology has been producing a pandemic lecture series, and they've created so far 14 lectures, lectures one to lecture 14, and they invite world experts to talk about each and every one of the dimensions of coronavirus from a biological perspective and an epidemiological perspective. So you cover coronavirus biology, you cover lessons learned from prior pandemics, insights that we've gained from the pandemic, how viral immunology works, things about the immune system in general, taking, talking about patients, going into epidemiology, and then uh, vaccines and antibodies and therapeutics and they keep releasing actually lectures. It's a really great series and I'd highly recommend it. This is an objective source by a credible university. MIT is MIT. It's one of the top technical schools in the world. And it's been put together by people who are either directly involved in the response or world experts who understand their domains far better than any of us can. Another corollary is this wonderful podcast from Vincent Racaniello and it's This Week in Virology. Uh, and uh, Vincent is a world famous virologist based, I believe, at Columbia. And he has this great show he's been running since before coronavirus. And he invites clinical experts in and he talks on a weekly basis about what's going on in virology. And he's trying to go through those preprints and so forth. Daily source of news about what is the daily status of coronavirus, what's going on is from Dr. John Campbell. I use him on a regular basis and basically pulled out a piece of paper and uh, John tells us uh, what happened today in coronavirus. And then finally, to explain more about these medical topics, not just in corona, but everything from RNA vaccines to how the immune system works to how asthma works, whatever you want, there's, some, uh, there's a great channel uh, called MedCram and uh, Roger, he has, is a quadruple board certified doctor in internal medicine, pulmonology, critical care, and sleep medicine. Respiratory viruses are his wheelhouse. This is what he does. And so corona is his thing. Now, 
these sources, especially the dynamic ones, Vincent, John, and uh, Roger, will give you a day-to-day -day feed on the pulse of coronavirus and really give you a nice uh, sampling of what's going on, what's coming on the horizon, and this is above the mass media fear porn that keeps being pushed upon us on a daily basis. Now, it took me quite a bit of time to get to these sources. Uh, it's easy, for example, with MIT, you say, okay, that's a good point. And, you know, learning about something, I say we have to understand it. Okay, MIT will do that. But then there's news, there's events, uh, there's a flow of things that happen every single day. For example, you guys will see in the news they talk about variants of corona. Okay, and the question of the hour is those variants of coronavirus, will the vaccines work or not? So everybody seems to have an opinion on this and everybody seems to be an expert on this. How many of you have actually done vaccine research and made vaccines? Very, 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 very few. Well, the people who do that for a living are these guys. You know, he knows a lot about it, invites the people who do it on a show he knows a lot about it and has given them for over 40 years in a public health perspective, invites the people who make them on a show. And these guys actually make them for a living. The people who come on the show are actually involved in that on a day in, day out basis. Okay. So there's a wealth of information about, well, what's real and what's not real there. Uh, and it turns out that immunology is a complex topic. Go figure. People get a PhD in it. People actually practice this as a field of medicine. They think about it for a long time. And it turns out that immunity is like a spectrum. Okay. And when you have a new variant, you can go from sterilizing immunity where the vaccine completely prevents infection and you're totally immune and who cares to completely ineffective, complete failure like most of the HIV vaccines, for example. They really don't show anything of value, okay? It's a whole spectrum. And so when you have a new variant, let's say variant alpha and then variant beta, it's gonna live somewhere on this spectrum. So when you get your vaccine that was made at time zero, that vaccine will have a profile against all the different variants and strains that are floating around. And you may get more immunity or less immunity, depending upon what happens there, okay? And that immunity is not just, well, uh, either you get it or you don't get it. It's also, if you become infected, how bad is the infection? Okay, so you have a spectrum there as well. And that can be you're in the ICU and death, and that can be asymptomatic. Okay, so even if you do get infected, perhaps because you've been vaccinated, you sit on that spectrum. It is entirely possible that a variant can exist that is more infectious, but less lethal. It's entirely possible that a variant can exist that's uh, less infectious, but more lethal. Okay. So these scales are very difficult to know, and they require quite a bit of domain expertise, and they require observations of the population in general. So when you think about these news and events, you say, okay, the vaccines were tested in a particular snapshot of time, T0. We began there and we said, okay, but what happens when we go to T1? What happens when we go to T2? So who's in charge of observing these things? And are we doing a good job of genetic surveillance to identify variants, gene surveillance? And are we doing a good job of parsing all this data and trying to figure out what's significant or not? Genetic surveillance is what revealed the Africa, the South African variant, and also revealed the UK variant, which is now showing up across the entire world. There apparently may be an Israeli variant as well. Okay. Then you have other events in the direction. For example, I did a video recently about Israel. And Israel is right now because of good leadership engaging in one of the fastest vaccination programs ever. They're approximately at 40% of population as of the time of the shooting of this video. And there's a very good chance that by March, 
uh, they should have 70% of population vaccinated. If that's the case, they actually might have herd immunity. We don't know because we actually don't know what herd immunity means for a novel virus. It's new. Okay. But the entire world should be watching Israel. They should be thinking about this because by March, they're going to have the single most valuable data point. The United States of America, we had a unique opportunity to create one as well. We could have, for example, vaccinated every single person in Hawaii was priority over the rest of the United States. Continue vaccinating the U.S., but give them enough doses to vaccinate 100% of the population. It's not a large population. It's a few hundred thousand people. But if they close the borders completely for a month or two, vaccinated everybody in Hawaii, then that could be our Israel. And we would have had a statistically significant population with a high tourism rate from Asia and from America that could completely reopen. And we could look at community spread. We could look at the level of sterilizing immunity. We get a huge amount of data points from having a sample like that. And it's an island. It's easy to do that with an island. We chose not to. Okay, so many policy decisions are being made right now. The level of genetic surveillance, the level of testing, the level of contact tracing. Uh, when can we reopen? And all of these require not only that you understand it, but it also requires you to ask good questions. And it also requires the right people to be in the room. And we, on the mass media side, don't ask questions. We don't ask who should be in the room. We don't think about a thought experiment, certain tests. On testing, for example, it turns out there's a significantly better way of doing it. And there's a great interview uh, in Lex Friedman's podcast with a world expert. His name is Michael Mina. He's a physician and epidemiologist and an immunologist at Harvard. And he has, if you go to the timescale right here, his rapid testing, he actually talks about a very low cost way that you can test an entire population on a regular basis in a very, 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 very uh, fast and cheap way. And it becomes an engineering problem, not a medical problem. Highly recommend you listen to this podcast. Uh, this guy's not in the room. Nobody talks to him. So despite the fact that we have all this domain expertise, there's all these amazing people who can decompose Corona as a global event into a engineering event as much as it is a scientific event, as much as it is a social event, these people aren't in the room. Because people who make decisions, they don't live in the information age. Our president, the United States is 78. The prior president was 74. I'm not an ageist, but I do acknowledge that if you're born of a different time, your thinking tools may not be well prepared for that time. For example, the biggest foundation in critical thinking is this one right here, the foundation for critical thinking. And uh, critical thinking, uh, Richard Paul was a titan in that field, and he's created all these amazing lectures, uh, and he has a huge book set and so forth. Like uh, all, uh, all guys who've been around for a really long time with foundations, there's always some critics and scandals. But all things considered, there's a, a huge amount of tools that they've built. All of these tools are phenomenal, and they are designed for a slow, methodical, expensive process. Okay? So if you follow them, you will be able, with any set of information, with enough time, to form an incredibly educated, very balanced ethical position on whatever that thing happens to be. Unfortunately, none of these tools are well suited for an age where information comes at you again and again and again and again like a fire hose. And that's a huge, huge problem. In fact, there's a great book. It's from Rolf uh, DeBelli, and it's called The Art of Thinking Clearly. And all Rolf did is he took a hundred cognitive biases and fallacies that we tend as human beings to get stuck into logical traps, cognitive errors, these types of things, or inability to reason with exponential growth. And he just put them all in a book. So it's got 100 short chapters, and each one is organized to a particular cognitive bias. Okay, All of these things get amplified as a consequence of social media. All of these things get amplified as a consequence of how information is spreading. They're mind viruses in a certain bit. 
And I would argue that as good as this is, this would be perfect for the 20th century and 19th century. Unfortunately, it's not good enough for our time period. There's some great lectures on critical thinking that actually are a little bit more useful. And this comes from the James Randi Foundation. Now, James Randi recently died, but uh, he was a very famous uh, magician and he was a very famous skeptic. And the thing about James Randi is uh, James uh, would, uh, would often hold uh, big competitions for the paranormal people. And so anybody was on Art Bell's show or George Norrie's show, he would challenge them. He said, come over and talk uh, to me. And if you can prove to me that you actually have discovered something paranormal, uh, then I'll give you a million dollars. No one ever claimed the prize because no one could ever prove to James uh, that uh, they actually had done something extraordinary. So anyway, uh, he made quite a bit of money throughout his life. And so he created a foundation shortly before he died. And the foundation focuses on critical thinking and skepticism and other things that come up in society. Well, there are 10 great lectures here taught by a lot of domain experts. And it goes uh, the keys of critical thinking, uh, cognitive biases, fast and slow thinking. So that's kind of a Danny Kahneman thing. It uh, talks about ESP, uh, recap and intro to the framework of critical thinking, uh, and a whole bunch of things. So highly recommend this, uh, this checklist, and I'll put all of these links in the show notes uh, for this uh, lecture. But anyway, even these, I would argue, are ineffective. The real value of coronavirus is that uh, it is telling us how to deal with a global event in an information age when the people that we normally trust to deal with these problems can't deal with it because the thinking tools that they have are frankly outdated. They need an update because the access and quantity of information is simply too high. This is why you see a big push by members of the media and by my country, the left, for censorship. You'll see term fake news. And so they say, because we have fake news, the only solution to this is deplatforming. As if somehow, some way, banning a person on a social network is going to prevent them from talking to other people when we live in an age of the internet. Unless you turn the internet off, deplatforming will be not effective in the spread of information. Just people will be pushed underground and they'll be pushed into less curated experiences where you lose the opportunity to combat distrust and skepticism and you lose the opportunity to perform better analysis on the information that's there. So what ends up happening is you go from one commons to a bunch of feedback loops that are all siloed. And each and every one of them, because they're confirm confirming their own biases, get more and more radicalized. And the spacing between these, the ideological spacing between these, grows tremendously. So what coronavirus did is it exposed that our software for thinking is wrong because the people running it either are economically conflicted and ideologically bent or simply running older software and they're in, incapable because of that older software to actually sort their way out of all of it. So the way that we move forward for any of these global events, and there were going to be many global events, uh, the rise of AI, that's going to be a big global event in the next 20 years. Uh, next one is nanotechnology. This is going to be a big global event within 20 to 30 years there's going to be CRISPR and genetic engineering of human beings and viruses and so forth. You can look up things like gene drives, for example, where they're actually having discussions of changing the genome of an entire species like mosquitoes. Okay, so there's CRISPR, there's nanotechnology, there's rise of AI, there's uh, next-gen weapons. For example, what if we could create nuclear weapons that have all the destruction but... Uh, none of the uh, long-term environmental impacts. What would that do to war? Or uh, tiny drones that you can release in swarms and they attach to your neck and explode. The, you could depopulate an entire city you know, if you have these flying drones in just a matter of a day or two. 
Okay, devastating stuff. Okay, so each and every one of these are global events, and they're going to fundamentally change human society. Uh, social credit in China in its proliferation is another. The great war on information and the flow of information. If we're not running the right software, actually another, actually what's going on right now, the rise of cryptocurrencies. I, I'd argue that it's of equal importance to any of these because it's fundamentally transforming society. Each and every one of these requires a software upgrade and our ability to analyze information and understand it. And coronavirus has definitely demonstrated that these people aren't going to solve it. These people are the enemy. They're not going to solve it. Uh, they, they've already decided that short-term wealth and power is more important than anything in society and that only one ideology matters. They've made up their minds of where the world needs to go. And because they can't handle this new world, they want to deplatform the entire new world. And we've seen if we leave things to their own devices, you end up getting a situation where people isolate silo and get very radicalized. And at some point, violence forms between these cliques. When you create tribes and the tribes get very radicalized, the tribes fight each other. And that's exactly what's starting to occur. We're starting to see the undercurrents of all those things. So the biggest legacy of coronavirus is perhaps a global awakening. The reality is we're going to get out of all of this. You know, these vaccines, if you actually go to all the links and sources I give you, the long and the short is that this year we're going to break the back of it. And then it's going to be with humanity probably forever floating around between people. It has a safe harbor reservoir in the unvaccinated developing world. It will continue to mutate. And some of those mutations will be problematic, but we'll do world genetic surveillance and we're going to couple the flu vaccination program with the COVID program, put them together. And then every year people get a booster shot and the vulnerable will be protected and we'll go back to life as normal. Not this year completely, but next year. Okay. And we move on. The real value is not this. I mean, there's tons of magical medical advancements that have occurred as a consequence of this. The real value is that the first time in a while, everybody in the planet has realized that we're having a global event and we're starting to expose all the cracks in the social systems that we have. What can you do as an individual? Well, as an individual, I'd highly recommend you take these lectures from the Randy Foundation. And you also, at the very least, read The Art of Thinking Clearly. And at the very least, you also uh, pay attention to people like Dan Dennett and so forth. Uh, for example, this video right here, Tools for Transforming Our Thinking, this, uh, these whole things. Yeah, he's very good at this stuff. And there's a lot of people that are thinking about how to solve this problem. Getting some better thinking tools is the start. But the reality is we do not have a canonical set of critical thinking stuff like this, like the Critical Thinking Foundation has for the information flows of our time. This was a finishing point, Richard Paul's work, for the 20th century. He's standing on the shoulders of Mortimer Atler, standing on the shoulders of so many people who thought very carefully about how to think carefully. And unfortunately, it's useless when you have too much and you have to make priorities and you have to outsource. And the reality is that cognition is no longer an individual concern. That's the final point of this video. There is an individual critical thinking, and then there's a collective. My opinions about coronavirus, I have outsourced to trusted parties because I'm not capable in my current wake of life of spending enough time to get deep enough and to understand enough about all of these things to be able to have something original in thought. So my trusted sources I've given to you, Vincent Rocaniello and the MedCram guys and Campbell, and then also what the people at MIT are telling me. Pretty good authorities. And I think most reasonable people would agree that they're qualified to have a domain-specific opinion. So it's okay to outsource the things that you think are happening to someone else, accepting that they could potentially be wrong. And that's why you go to a multi-model set. And that's why you go to multiple sources. So I went from one to a collection and they're balanced, not just with a US centric view, but across the globe. For example, John Campbell is based in uh, the UK. 
And then I also look at a lot of data. I look at the Bloomberg data that's compiled on vaccinations. I look at the Israeli data. I'm looking at what's happening with uh, Serum's work over in India and seeing how things are materializing there. So I've outsourced from an individual to a collective mindset my critical thinking on Corona. Now, that's not a uh, that's not an absolute outsource. I still have a filter test where it turns out that a lot of the techniques that come from Randy's lectures and a lot of techniques that come from Richard Allen and wrote a lovely book as well. Yeah, the miniature guide, the critical thinking he has actually, I think 40 of these guides uh, for everything from how to read a paragraph to how to ask questions, guide to fallacies. I obviously still have some filters, but you see, it's much easier for me to filter what four people are telling me rather than what social media has with 4,000 people telling me something. Okay, so this, I actually can take the time to apply the 20th century thinking tools and I can hold them accountable. For example, every now and then, I, John Campbell says something and I say, I don't know about that. And so then I really think carefully about it and goes through it. But for the most part, that's a fast test and it really helps me in that. Over time, artificial intelligence is gonna come in and what AI is going to do is assist us in the application of thinking filters. This is perhaps one of the most valuable advancements for the information age. It hasn't occurred yet, but this is a big deal. And I think artificial intelligence has a huge play, place to play here. Where when you decide how to create good collective thought, collective curation of thought. So we got rid of mass media, but we found other sources that are trusted. There's still going to be potentially too many of them, and they're not going to be paired in the right way. It's extremely important that you pair thoughts together. So for example, for every hour of Ben Shapiro I listen to, I listen to an hour of Sam Harris. It kind of balanced the world for me. If you listen to too much Shapiro, you listen to too much Harris, you only get one viewpoint, you become imprinted and biased there. So it's important to ideologically and, and from a fact basis, pair your ideas together. Well, what an AI can do is an enforcement mechanism. Make sure have you constructed the right pairs? You know, are you thinking about the right things? Have you accounted for common cognitive biases that you have? This is a missing component of the information economy. The other is incentives. The mass media could be incredibly effective at being a collective source of information for us. And I think that uh, they have been in certain cases, but for the most part aren't anymore because the incentives are wrong. They make money if there's a scandal. They make money if a certain ideology wins. They make money if we're afraid. So everything is a scandal. Everything is ideological. Everything is social justice, this and this, that, and blah, rah, rah. It's an agenda because that agenda makes some money. So what if you realign the incentives for the curation of information so that you make more money if you go from subjective opinion to objective reality? And you separate those who provide objective reality from those who are annotating subjective reality. You create a more explicit separation, and if you don't directly do it, have an AI do that to pull the stuff apart, because this is where we should agree, regardless of our ideology. The asteroid hit Texas, we can all agree. This is where values come into play. And we may have different values. And it's, sometimes it's worthwhile to explicitly separate them. But that's where values come into play. And we're not going to necessarily agree. The problem is because they've become blended, we no longer can agree even on objective reality. For example, this video, I guarantee you there's at least one person who's going to comment on it who firmly believes that coronavirus is a hoax and it doesn't exist, that it's not real. I have people who message me over Twitter, Reddit, Telegram, sending me links to say that viruses don't exist. 
and that all of the science for germ theory is, is made up and it's a global conspiracy. We are having trouble getting to an objective reality where we can agree on the same set of facts, even though our values can and should be different. Diversity matters. So the other big challenge of the 21st century is when do we need to build up our muscles of critical thinking and information curation as individuals to filter things? And what critical thinking skills are most relevant for that kind of curation? And how do we develop institutions that collectively can curate information for us? And then we can vet those institutions instead of vetting every single source of information that we're getting from social media. AI, I believe, is going to have a huge part. Incentives, I believe, are going to have a huge part. And I also believe that some government reform might be able to help us out a little bit there too. If we can kind of rein in some of these uh, mass media people a bit, that's a whole separate conversation, but uh, it's very clear that there's propaganda in one particular direction and monopolistic views in one particular direction. And it's having a huge impact on our ability to think as a society. Complex topic, not going to be solved in a single video, but I hope this gives you guys some way uh, of understanding how I think and how things are connected together. You know, everything in life is, is very interdependent. It's very connected. One of the biggest things that I learned early on uh, was, you know, as we grow as humans, we start as a dependent, then at some point we become independent, and then at some point we become interdependent. So the 30-year-old kid never moves out of his parents' basement. He's here. Uh, maybe the loner lives in an apartment, doesn't have many friends, is here. And the very successful, happy social person is here. Okay, so there's a spectrum as you move. And your level of joy, success, happiness, and resilience is dependent on where on the scale you become. Well, information is no different. Social structures are no different. Everything is very complex. These are very complex systems. And as they move from dependent to interdependent systems, uh, they are very difficult to analyze. And what coronavirus did is it just took something that was a surface problem and a real that it is actually a global event. And again, it showed us that the systems we currently have were inadequate to solve it. It showed that the healthcare system was more than capable of making vaccines quickly. It was more capable of publishing gargantuan amounts of research very quickly and actually figure out new therapeutics very quickly. So that's a big win. And it brought a whole new dawn of treatments, for example, mRNA vaccines, which are going to have a huge impact on the treatment of cancer in the next 10 or 20 years. So we got a lot out of that. We got a lot out of mass testing and genetic surveillance of diseases. We got a lot of, of huge advancements for the treatment of ARDS for ICUs, and they probably advanced the whole field of pulmonology by at least a decade or two as a result of this. And we've learned a huge amount about epidemiology and virology in general. And we've learned a lot about effective distribution of vaccines and ineffective distribution of vaccines. Okay. But we also learned that, unfortunately, society is not quite prepared for a global event in the information economy. And we learned that there's a big difference between individual curation of information and collective curation of information. And we don't have cognitive filters and mirrors to assist us yet. And there's a huge social need for cognitive filters and mirrors, AI enforced ideally, and also a huge incentive issue where we need to rebuild the incentives of the collective so that they assist in the separation of objective and subjective uh, information. We've learned all of that. And I hope that this leads to a tremendous amount of social innovation and information innovation. And if you watch any of the videos that I've given you, I'd highly recommend watching what Lex did here on the coronavirus. And I'd highly, highly, highly recommend uh, watching the critical lecture series from the Randy Foundation, just to give you guys a sense of where we're at. And I mentioned there's all these books and these other things. This is just a beginning. It's not an end in any sense. I always end these types of lectures with the same statement. Think for yourself.
Why? Because anytime we have a global event, there's an isomorphism between all of them. And that isomorphism is that each global event requires each and every one of us to have an opinion on it. Surveillance capitalism and the rise of social credit and uh, government curation of what is legitimate thought. The fact that we're creating a new entity, a new species, a new creature, and it's going to be smarter than us. And by the way, every time that's happened by evolution, the smartest always usually went out in the long term and they kill all of the others. The rise of nanotechnology creates materials that nature can't and therefore nature can't address and deal with the gray goo problem. Gray goo. The fact that we can change the human organism and create new species that uh, will transcend others and create huge social problems, weapons that can end the human race. We've nearly done it twice in the 20th century. We're gonna have more opportunities here. And my industry, the rise of cryptocurrencies. These are global events right on par with pandemics. And the pandemic is the first time in our information age we've had a global event. This is a great opportunity for us to realize that the information requirements for each and every one of these are the same. And if we are incapable of dealing with the pandemic, we will not be capable of dealing with any of these in a desirable way. The easiest way of dealing with this is centralized control. You hand the magic to a master. You say, I can't do it. I'm not qualified to do it. Here you go. You take care of it. We did this with nuclear weapons. We created a very aggressive nuclear weapon proliferation program because we realized they were global and existential. And if not handled properly, the human race would end. And even still, there were two events, the Cuban Missile Crisis and a software bug in the 1980s with a, a, a Russian colonel named Pavel, where both events could have ended the human race. And in both events, there was literally just a single human being who made the decision not to end the world. One person with no checks and balances. That's it. Even so, we handed to a master all that power. They almost resulted in the destruction of mankind. And that was one system. And then imagine all of these systems. One, two, three, four, five, six that have a potential to dramatically change the race, either to extinct us or to enslave us. This is why it's so incredibly important that you think for yourself, because either somebody is going to think for you and decide for you, one person, and let's hope that they don't end the world, or we can think together. And the odds are, if we think together, that mankind will be able to get through the 21st century without an extinction event, and that we will live in a far better world. Thank you so much for listening. This was a lot of fun to make, and I hope this lecture was valuable to you. Cheers.